Hey, come on, will you stand to your feet this morning as we get into the Word? Anybody here love the Word of God? Let's try that again. Anybody here love the Word of God? Man, can I tell you, the Word of God not only encourages, but it transforms you. Anybody here just been completely and totally transformed by the Word of the Lord? Come on. I love the Word of God. It changes everything. I, there's been moments in my life where I was discouraged, and I got into the Word, and I got encouraged. Isn't that amazing how a book that's over 2,000 years old can still encourage us today, can still bring forth life, breathe life into you today? Man, that's wonderful. By the way, Chelsea, I see you back there, girl. We should have just had you sing that song live. Wish, wish we would have known you're here. I'm glad you're here. It's awesome to have you home. Awesome. Well, hey, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. While you're there, let me just preface kind of this message. How many of you were here for the People's Conference? Wasn't that powerful? And uh, Samuel Rodriguez spoke a word about the mantle of God. And this moment of handing off the, the mantle or the anointing from Elijah to Elisha. And what was interesting is Pastor Andrew and I, our, our pastor in Oahu, we, we were having a conversation about starting a series entitled Pick It Up. And uh, one of the messages in that series was about how Elisha picked up the mantle of Elijah. And so it was just a confirmation for me that that's the direction God wanted us to go. And so starting a series entitled Pick It Up. Look at that person next to you and say, Pick It Up! Second yeah. Kings chapter 2, verse 9. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you open our ears to hear our hearts to receive that we may be changed by the power of your word. Lord, let's, let us not simply be hearers of the word and so deceive ourselves, but doers also in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning, if you're taking notes, is pick up that mantle. Come on, say it with me. What? Pick up that mantle. When we read this passage, we see this incredible interaction that happens between Elijah and Elijah. And Elisha, and you know, there's a moment it reminded me of something. There was a day uh, I was walking on the beach, and there's, you know, living in Hawaii, one of the benefits of walking on the beach, you know, or living in Hawaii is we get to walk on the beach and just enjoy the sand between our toes, right, and watch the tourists get pounded by waves. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's, it's awesome. Entertainment, right? That's like local entertainment. Like, what? Bro, where are you going? Bro, I'm going Big Beach. Why? I like watch the tourists get pounded by the waves. Hush. Good fun, bro. Good fun. <laughs> entertainment. If you're a tourist, by the way, we love you. Just don't turn your back on the waves. Come on, watch the video at the airport, all right? Don't turn your back on the waves. Anyways. I was at the beach one day and just walking up and down the beach and all of a sudden I see it. Have you guys ever been there before? Like you see money on the ground, right? I got so excited because out of the sand I see a hundred dollar bill coming right out of the sand. I'm like, oh, today, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. 
I was excited, man. So I, I come around. Of course, I do the whole, you know, I'm like looking, making sure there's nobody around. I'm like, is this anybody's money? Is this anybody's money? Anybody? Is this your money? And man, I was so excited. I bend over and I pick up that $100 bill. I put it in my pocket. And man, I was excited. Now, you got to realize something. This was, this was the days where you guys remember, I, they may even have it back, but you guys remember when they had the kitchen, the kitchen in Kihei. Oh, bro. Holy Spirit, I just, no, just, so this is a day when they had the kitchen in Kihei. Now, you got to understand something. I love the kitchen, okay? So I went to the kitchen, and I was like, oh, I got this $100 bill. I'm going to go get what I like, which is the fish and chips. You know, like that, the, the, the tempura fish, right, with the French fries. I was like, bro, I got this. So I get up there, and I put in my order, because I got this $100 bill in my pocket. Problem was, I pull it out, and I realized something. It wasn't a $100 bill. It was one of those $100 bills that was half $100 bill and half gospel track. <laughs> oh, you think I'm joking right now? No, I'm like... John 3 16 so God so loved the world and he goes God if you love me this would have been a real hundred dollar bill <laughs> probably one of the most embarrassing moments of my life pick it up with a story I realized something that there was a moment there was an opportunity that Elisha had he, he didn't have to pick up that mantle he could have rejected it. He could have looked at it and said, I'm not doing this. But he understood the value of that mantle. He understood the calling. And this morning, I want us to look at this because the first thing I have to establish, really, if we're going to understand, if we're going to understand this passage in all its complexity, we have to understand the importance of the mantle. What is a mantle? Well, simply put, when you look at that word mantle in its original context, very simply, that word mantle means a covering. It, all it was, was a, it was a covering, a loose sleeve covering that went over your, all your garments. And uh, really, it was that that kept you, from the, kept you protected from the rain, kept you protected from the sun. It was an outer garment. That's all it was. It was a covering. But when you begin to dig deep and understand the essence of the mantle, you begin to realize that the mantle was an identity, meaning this, that it identified or marked certain people. You could tell if someone was poor by their covering, by their mantle. You could tell whether someone was a government official by their mantle. You could tell if someone was a prophet by their Mantle. They were marked by the mantle that they wore. See, because the mantle was a marker of identity. It marked your calling. It marked your authority. Just like if a police officer, right, shows you his badge, you're like, oh, huh, sorry, because you realize he has the authority to arrest you, right? And that badge is that symbol of authority in the same way a mantle was a symbol of calling and authority. Everybody say that with me, what? Calling and authority. So when we understand Elijah's mantle, the mantle that he wore was the prophet's mantle. People could identify Elijah coming from a far way off by the mantle he wore because it identified or it signified his calling and the authority in God that he carried. Wow. When Elijah was coming, people would see him and they would recognize him by his mantle. It would bring expectation, the prophetic word, it would bring expectation of a move of God. It would bring an expectation of authority and power upon people. So we have to understand the significance of the mantle. See, when Elisha picked up that mantle, from Elijah, he realized something, that everything in his life was about to change. His very identity was about to change. He couldn't go back to his old life. 
The moment Elisha picked up that mantle, he said, I'm surrendering my old life and I'm embracing my new life. He embraced a new identity. Friends, can I tell you, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are taking hold. We are embracing a brand new identity. Jesus, can I tell you right now, first and foremost, Jesus is your mantle. We have the name of Jesus. His name is what identifies us. I'm no longer identified by Josh Morocco. I'm a son of the most living God, the son of the most high God. I am the son of God. Are you with me? I am a child of God. I belong to him. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives inside of me. And the life I now live in Christ, I live unto the Son of God. I have a new identity. I have a new purpose. I have a new calling in Jesus. But you know what's so significant too? is when we look at the life of the disciples on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was poured out upon them, we see that there was a mantle that came upon them. There was a marking that came upon them. It was the marking of the Holy Spirit. They were now filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So we see very clearly that there's a shifting of identity a shifting of calling and a shifting of power and authority. And a lot of us, we want the anointing. We want everything that the quote-unquote mantle has to offer. We want to step into the calling of God. We want to walk into the power and the authority of God. Come on, how many of you business owners would like to walk in the power and the authority of God? But there's something very significant that characterized Elisha's life. And before we move forward in this message, I, I want us to look at these two distinct characteristics that defined Elisha's life. Number one is Elisha served Elisha. Elijah. Elisha served Elijah. What's interesting about Elisha is we see very clearly that Elisha had a greater passion to serve than to carry the anointing. I'm going to say that one more time. He actually had a greater passion to serve than to carry the anointing. Well, Pastor, how would you say that? It's because Elisha walked with Elijah and kept walking with Elijah multiple times. Elijah's like, hey, bro, you don't need to go any further. He says, no, I'm going to serve you. It wasn't till the end of that time that Elijah says to Elisha, hey, what do you want from me? And then he says, you know what? I'll take a double portion anointing. Because he knew, are you ready for this? He didn't want a double portion anointing so he could show off. He wanted a double portion anointing because he knew what his nation needed. He knew what the calling required. He couldn't just be another run-of-the-mill prophet. He needed to be a man that could step into the power and the, the calling of God on his life. But we see very clearly that he had a passion to serve. See, the problem with a lot of people today, nobody in this room, but the problem that we see that happens a lot today, that people have a propensity to use serving as a means to an end. We serve in order to get. We serve because we want to obtain something or we want favor. I'll serve Dr. Morocco and I'll, I'll serve this way and I'll serve that way because then, then I'll become a pastor or a minister. That's not how it works. Serving isn't a means to an end. Serving begins with a delight and a desire to love Jesus. And in everything you do, you do it as unto the Lord, not as unto man. That's what's interesting. If we get a mantle... If we receive an anointing or we receive a mantle without a season of serving, we'll think that the mantle exists to serve us. I've seen it. People become too big for their britches or they become elevated too quickly and all of a sudden they think that the anointing of God exists to serve their desire and serve their wants and to serve their vision versus us existing to serve the Lord. 
That's why seasons of serving are so crucial. It's because it develops within us an understanding and an alignment and an alignment to say that my life exists to serve God instead of God existing to serve me. But the other characteristic of Elisha's life that was to me so monumental, it was powerful, was this. Not only did he serve Elijah, but he honored Elijah. What's so unique about this story is um, when Elijah was raptured up, the Bible explains that Elisha cried out, my father, my father, and he tore his clothes. And we have to understand first and foremost that Elijah was not Elisha's father. But there was such an honor that he had for Elijah. And can I tell you right now that one thing that's missing within society today, I'm not just talking about the church, one thing that's missing in society is we're missing honor. The foundation of honor in our lives. We have a generation that thrives, that actually that brags about how rebellious they are. But what they don't realize is that the blessing comes through honoring. A lot of people want the blessing of God. A lot of people want to be blessed, but they don't want to honor. Many of you have heard me talk about the life of Jesus and how the Bible says that he could do no miracles in his hometown because there is familiarity. He says a prophet is without honor in his hometown. Isn't that interesting? That the people of his hometown missed out on what Jesus had for them because they lacked honor. One of the reasons why I believe Elisha was able to take hold and was positioned to take hold of the mantle of Elijah is because he served Elijah, but he also honored Elijah. Now, can I, can I tell you right now, I want to be very careful how I say this because this isn't a message to try and get you guys to honor Dr. Morocco more. Because can I be very honest with you? I don't know a better group of people that knows how to honor their pastor than you guys. I've seen it. I've lived with you guys for 43 years. I've seen you guys honor Dr. Morocco and Pastor Colleen. But friends, one thing that I realize that the church needs to grow in is we need to know how to honor one another. Because the calling on that person's life sitting right next to you is just as important as your calling. It's just as power. It may be different. But friends, they have a calling. They have a purpose. And we need to learn how to serve and to honor one another. Come on. Our, a lot of us are good at serving and honoring up, but do we know how to serve and honor all around? Two characteristics to me that really defined Elisha was he was a man that was passionate about serving, and he was a man that honored. So we see that there's a mantle. Every one of you has a calling, every one of you has a purpose. Every single one of you, God has called you to something so significant, whether you're a teacher, whether you're, whether you're a, a, I don't even know, what, what, what else we got over here? Lots of things. There's so many things, whether you're a surfer, whether you're a teacher, come on, whether you work at a hotel, whether you're a boss, you own your own business, come on, whether you're a politician, whatever it may be, God's got a calling and he's got an anointing, a distinct calling on your life. we've got to implement within our life serving and honoring but the third thing that we see very clearly is not only not only did Elisha understand the mantle not only did Elisha really epitomize serving and honoring but we see Elisha do something that was profound he picked up the mantle everybody say pick it up Come on, everybody say, pick it up. Pick it up. There's a battle of the pickup. 
Anybody here ever play pickup sticks? Come on, anybody, anybody love that game? Can I tell you, I hate the game of pickup sticks because I got some fat fingers, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, ah, I always hit like 20 different sticks at the same time. I'm like, I can't get one. I don't, I don't like playing that game with my wife or my kids because they have like tiny little fingers, these long, slim fingers. I'm like, this ain't fair. You ain't Morocco's. Like, I think that it's like a qualification. In order to be in Morocco, you have to have fat hands. Anyways, just, just saying. Come on, man. Have you seen those? Come on. How many of you guys have been prayed by Dr. Morocco and his hands just like, like whoops. It, we don't call his hands hands. We call them claws, like bare paws, right? It's like. Poof. Some of you are like, are you allowed to say that? I got fat hands. It's okay. I love Jesus. I want you to hear this. You're always picking up something. You're always picking up something. I want you to think about this moment. So there's something significant that happens in this passage. As Elijah is taken, again, the Bible says that Elisha cried out, my father, my father. And then we see very clearly that he rips his clothes. Now, the significance, the cultural significance of Elisha ripping his clothes, it was mourning. In that culture, when someone was to die or you were going to lose or you lost somebody, you would rip your clothes as a sign of great mourning. Even in the midst of his mourning, in the midst of his fear, in the midst of his doubt, he still picked up the mantle can I tell you how many people have been hindered from picking up their calling and walking in the anointing because they've lost something because they've been fearful I mean think about think about this everybody knew everybody knew what happened between Jezebel and Elijah it was no secret of the battles that Elijah had to fight. And here's now Elisha realizing that if he picks up that mantle, he's not just picking up the call. He's not just picking up the anointing. He's also picking up the fight. He's going to have to pick up the challenges. He's going to have to pick up the frustration. He's going to have to pick up some of the things that he's going to have to go through. And can I tell you, if it was me, I'd look at that in great fear and trepidation going, I don't know if I want that. I don't know if I want that fight. I don't know if I want that burden. Very easy for Elisha to pick up fear. For, Eli for Elisha to say, wait a second, wait, I was a farmer, man. I'm not a prophet, I'm a farmer. He could have doubted himself, doubted the calling. He could have completely and totally been derailed. Say, well, you know what, God, if you love me, you wouldn't have taken Elisha. What are you picking up? Can I ask you have, you, have you picked up something that's not of God? That, that thing that's in your hand right now, that thing that you're wearing and carrying around with you that, <laughs> that defines you, is that from God? Or are you wearing your fear? Are you wearing your doubt? Are you wearing your disappointment? Are you wearing your loss? Friends, there's so many things that we're picking up that have hindered us from picking up what God has called you to, what God has for you. I want to pick up what God has for me. But this is the thing. If in order to pick up something, you've got to let something go. You know, a lot of us, man, and maybe this is just me, but there's been moments in my life where I have been so encumbered by a lot of different things because I'm picking up this and I'm picking up that and I'm picking up that and I'm picking up this and I got this and I got that and I'm carrying all this stuff and God's like, you got a whole lot of stuff and none of it is of me. And the very thing that I've called you to, you're juggling around and it's falling all over the place. I'm just talking about me. I'm not preaching to anybody here. I'm just telling you some of my struggles. We've all lived a life encumbered by so many different things, whether it be distractions or whether even at times we're picking up things that we think are of God but apparently aren't, but we don't know how to let them go because we're so emotionally, sometimes spiritually, sometimes physically attached to things. 
Are you guys with me? Come on. I've seen people get physically attached in relationships. God has something so profound for them, but they're so attached to that that they can't let it go to embrace what God has for them. We get attached to a doctrine. We get attached to an ideology that we can't let go of. And God's saying, I have something so great for you, but you got to let it go. You know what I loved? Can I tell you what I loved about Elisha? Elisha didn't just give everything to his father and say, okay, dad, all the, all the proceeds of everything that I have and everything that I got, I'm just going to give it to you, dad. I'm going to, because this is what he understands. If he would have just kept it, left it to his dad, it would have been an inheritance for him. It means it would have been something he could have gone back to if the ministry failed. But you know what he did? He sacrificed all of it. I look at that story, I'm like, dude, you should have kept something on the side, right? He sacrificed it all. He said, I'm sold out. He let everything go. If we're going to embrace the new, a lot of us want to step into the new. We want the new identity. We want that with God, which God has for us, but we're still carrying around the old. Many times we reject the new because we're satisfied with the old. This is good for me, Pastor. I, I'm, I'm okay with this. I don't want to start a new life group, Pastor. I'm, I'm satisfied with my us four and no more. Pastor, I don't want to join a new ministry. I'm, I'm satisfied with this ministry. I've been doing this ministry, Pastor, for 43 years. I'm, I'm satisfied. Sometimes satisfaction can become the greatest enemy of destiny. I'll say this, sometimes satisfaction, being satisfied in one area of your life can become the greatest hindrance from walking in the greatest power and anointing and call that, has, that God has for you. We got to be careful that we don't make satisfaction an enemy of destiny. He knew that God had more for him. He knew that God had a great calling for him. But this is the question that I have to ask you because I really believe this is what the pickup is all about. Is it worth picking it up? Anybody here been like super, super tired? Exhausted, exhausted. You're like, I don't want to bend over. Right? I don't want. And you saw a penny, I, you saw a penny on the ground. Now I know some of us still believe that pennies give you luck. And that's okay. God bless you. Dios le bendiga. Pennies, pennies don't give you luck, right? Okay, just making sure. I was just making sure that we don't believe that. All right. Now, I know that, you know, there may be those who still believe pennies give you luck, and so you see, you're like, oh, penny! And you freak out, and you pick up the penny, right? But let me just tell you about me. Pennies are the last thing I want to pick up. I'm just like, you can stay there. Anybody with me? Because it doesn't have much value for me. I don't really give a rip if it's a penny. Now, look, if I'm in a store and I'm a penny short, I will, I will go through that entire store. Anybody got a penny? Anybody got a penny? Anybody got a penny? My, my daughters have been watching this series of a kid that starts off with a penny. And he tries to go across the nation starting with one penny. It's crazy. But a penny doesn't have much value. It doesn't have much worth. So for most of us, when we're tired, when we're weak, when we're beat up, we don't want to bend over and grab a little penny on the ground because it's not worth much. But man, I'm telling you what, if there was a $100 bill there, man, if you had crutches, you'd be getting those crutches being like, God, get this, get this. Come on, right? You would do anything you could to get that $100 bill because it's got great worth. Can I ask you a question? Is your calling and your anointing the authority and the power of God in your life worth picking up to you?
I want you to ponder on that for a moment. Because we will always pursue that which is worthwhile to us. In your heart of hearts, is your calling worth it? Is your calling truly worth laying everything down? Pastor, I'm just a teacher. See, that's your problem. You've devalued what God has for you. Pastor, I'm just a, I'm a, I own a small business. You've devalued what God's called you to. Every single one of you, God has a profound, amazing calling that requires, I need you to hear this, you have an amazing calling that requires an anointing. The stay-at-home mom, come on. That is a calling that requires an anointing. You know, still till this day, to this day, you ask my mom, what was the greatest role that you played in the beginning of this church? She says, raising my kids. Because my son needed Jesus. I don't know why she always says that, but she's like, my son needed Jesus. She didn't look at it as a downgrade. She wasn't embarrassed by it. She understood that it was a calling that she needed an anointing for. Can I tell you, your marriage is a calling that needs an anointing. Come on, your children is a calling. They are a calling that needs an anointing. Being a teacher is a calling that needs an anointing. Whatever you are, whatever you do, it is a calling. It is a God calling that needs God power and God authority. It's worth, it's got to you, it's got to be worth picking up. Oh, I am pastor, I'm getting tired of going to work every day. Why are you devaluing your job? Now, I'm not saying God may not have something new for you, but you'll never pick up the supernatural until you see its value. Is it worth picking up to you? But lastly, I want to close with this point. Are you ready for this? Use it or it's useless. I'll say that again. Use it or it's useless. I want you to imagine for a moment you walk into a room, a dark room. Dr. Morocco uses this analogy all the time. You walk into a, a dark room, no light. But you realize in that room exists a light switch. And there is power, there's electricity surging through the walls of that room that are attached to that switch that it, all you have to do is flip the switch and the lights come on. How many of you would wander in the dark? Well, we do live in Hawaii and we want to save electricity. You know what, that's not a good question. That's... No, honestly, how many of you would wander in the dark knowing that there's a switch that would bring on the lights that you could see? None of us would. We all, the first thing, I mean, for most of us, it's habitual. The first thing we do is flip on the lights. If you're like my kids, you leave them on all day. Come on. Come on. No, I got any parents that would witness? Can I, get any, can I get a witness in here? Come on. How many, how many of you parents? Man, listen, I am 43 years old. And my father-in-law, when I go over to their house, is still telling me, hey, turn off the lights. I'm like, oh, that's right. I'm so sorry. I just uh, flipped the switch. So bad. Am I right? Don's sitting there looking, looking at me going, that's right, man. Save some electricity, brother. What's wrong with you? That's how the power of God works. If you don't use it, it becomes useless. See, the challenge it's a challenge that we have to operate in the anointing. An unchallenged anointing is shallow and weak. An anointing that is not used is wasted. So the, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's power to function. You know what that means? It takes the natural teacher and turns him into a supernatural teacher. A natural spouse and turns him into a supernatural spouse. Come on, it, it, it turns a natural business owner into a 
supernatural business. See, I want you to get a picture. See, there's a supernatural life that exists for you by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Word of God. It is the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. It is the anointing of God in your family that brings forth freedom and life and transformation. There is an anointing that exists for you, and you can pick it up. You go, oh, Pastor, I'm spirit-filled. Right. Are you using it? Are you walking in the fullness that God has for you? Man, I, I don't know about you, but I want to be, I want to be the believer that walks in the fullness that God has for me. I realize something, that there are gifts of the Spirit that are available to me. That by what Christ has done in me and through me, and what the Holy Spirit, that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and quickens your mortal body, that the Holy Spirit working in me has given me access to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's not because I have a title. It's not because I'm learned or studied. It's because I'm a child of the Most High God. I got to tell you something. Every opportunity I have, I begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. I pray in the Holy Spirit. Pastor, why do you do that? Because I need my natural to become supernatural. Every opportunity I have, I get the wisdom of the Word of God. I get the Word of God in me. Why? Because the Word of God is not just information, it's transformation. So the more of the Word of God, it turns my natural into supernatural. I pray as much as I possibly can. Why? Because when I pray, I have audience with God, and he has audience with me. The ears of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. So you better believe every time I'm praying, every time I'm in interaction with God, it is changing my natural into supernatural. you got to understand that there is an anointing, there is a mantle, there is a supernatural that exists for you, that if you'll tap in, you can walk in the supernatural. You don't have to do what you do in your own strength. To me, the pinnacle of this story is that moment where Elisha not only picks up the mantle of Elijah, <laughs> but the Bible says as he goes to the Jordan. Whew. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know if any of you have ever had apprehension where you're about to step into something crazy. Like, I don't know what I'm about to do. I'm about to start this life group. I don't know if anybody's going to show up. I'm about to join this ministry. I don't know what's about to happen. I'm about to, I'm about to start this business. I don't know what's going to take place. I'm about to start this new job. I'm about to do this. I'm about to do that. I'm about, come on, somebody. Whew. And the Bible says he strikes the water. You know what's amazing? that the same power that split the water for Elijah split the water for Elisha. Elisha could have stayed on the other side of the Jordan. He would have been stuck there. Can I tell you there's a lot of stuck Christians. They're on the wrong side of the Jordan. They're on the wrong side of destiny and purpose. Why? Because they have all the calling. They have all the gifting. They have all the talent. But they're not walking in the anointing. We're spirit-filled believers. We believe in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we got to pick up our mantle. There's, an, there's a mantle, there's an anointing, and there is a calling that exists for you. Will you take hold of it? Will you pick it up? Some of you may be full of fear. Maybe you're full of frustration. Maybe some of you, you went through something in your life that completely and totally derailed you. Maybe it was a loss. I don't know. Many times we need to be like Elisha. Elisha mourned for a moment. But then he picked up the mantle. He stepped into his calling. 
If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I want to step into my calling. I want to step into everything that God has for me. You can be honest. You say, Pastor, I feel so far away from what the Lord wants to do in my life. I feel stuck. Maybe some of you, you've been apprehensive because you don't have confidence in yourself. For some of you, maybe your confidence has been shaken. We've all battled that. You make a mistake, man, all of a sudden my confidence is shaken. I don't know what you're battling right now, but there may be things in your life that are keeping you from picking up the calling of God on your life, from picking up and operating the power of God in your life. And you say, Pastor, I want that. I want that in my life. If that's you on the count of three, right where you are, just lift your hands to the Lord. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, right now. Right now, right now, right now, right now. Come on. Come on, come on. Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Lord, I break off fear right now. Lord, I break off doubt right now. Those who have been doubting the call because of your past, Lord, I break that off now in Jesus' name. And I speak life, and I speak destiny, and I speak purpose and anointing now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Some of you have been lied to. You've been given into a lie and an ideology that is not of God, and it has derailed you. Father, I pray now in Jesus' name. Spirit of God, come. Spirit of God, come in power. Spirit of God, come in power. Right now, right now. Lord, let your anointing fall fresh on us this morning. Pastor Glenn, right where you are, I just want you and Minister Billy, just lift your hands to the Lord. You can stay seated right there. For the Lord says, Son, I'm pouring out on you a fresh mantle and a fresh anointing. You've been obedient to the call. You have served and you have honored. And the Lord says, I'm giving you greater strength. I'm giving you greater fire. For your light has not grown dim, the Lord says. But get ready right now for a reigniting. In the name of Jesus, there's going to be greater fruit than you've ever experienced. A greater harvest than you've ever seen in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And there is freedom. Someone has been bound by addiction. And even today, you're like, Lord, I want to lay it down, but I don't know how. I want to lay it down. I don't know how. God says you are free in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I pray freedom to invade this place right now. A spirit of encouragement. Man, I just need to pray that right now. How many of you, you're here just by a show of hands, I just feel like the Lord wants to release a spirit of encouragement in this place. If that's you, you feel discouraged right now with where you're at. I want you to lift your hands. Come on, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. Spirit of God. Lord, I pray for a spirit of encouragement. Lord, let a spirit of encouragement be released right now. Those who are weary. Those who are weary. You feel frail. You feel frail in body and even in mind and soul and in spirit. But, Lord, I pray an igniting of strength, a spirit of encouragement to come upon them now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Wow. Uh, there's an anointing in this place right now. Jesus freedom freedom Lord thank you Jesus won't someone say pick it up won't someone say pick it up I think we need to give Jesus a shout of praise in this place amen hallelujah 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 you know, this morning, um, I want you to, I want you, everybody to just watch this video real quick. Can you check this out?
Come on, isn't that awesome? We are all together one, 427 churches, international churches. And so once a month, once a month, we always give people an opportunity. No one's forced to do this, but we want to give you an opportunity to sow into missions. And uh, we support churches around the world. And uh, I, I shared this story first service. God allowed me to go to our church in Chile. And as we were there, um, it was right after that big, massive earthquake that happened in Chile. And we went to Talca, and where, where really was the kind of the epicenter of that earthquake. And yeah, ushers, go ahead and hand out envelopes. Because if you need an envelope to keep track of your giving record, if you want to give, if you want to give, uh, you can follow the intuitive prompts on the screen. You can go to download the King Central app. This offering is going to missions, and so I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity. No one's forced to give. We want to give you an opportunity to give to missions. But we go up to uh, we go to Talca, and as we were there, we we arrive in the city, and there were church after church after church that were completely collapsed. You had the front wall and the back wall, and that's it. Everything in between was all collapsed. And uh, ushers, we have people in the sound booth that need to give. Help them. They're, they're waving you down, ushers. They're waving you down. Sorry, I'm like, they're waving. I'm like, what, is my fly down or something like that? I'm like, what's going on here? You're freaking me out. And I realize they're trying to get the ushers attention. So we go to Talca and, and we go by all these churches and the front wall is up, the back wall is up and everything in between is, is collapsed. And I go to this church, I'm going to minister at King's Chapel, Talca and it's amazing. And there's hundreds of people there and all of a sudden these pastors come up to me and they're like, they, wanna, they just wanna shake my hand. And I'm, I'm asking Pastor Itilo who's with me, I said, what's going on? And they said, they just wanna shake the hand of this man who supported this church because King's Chapel, Talca, was the only church having church because that week after the earthquake, we took a massive offering globally and took up enough money for them to be able to get a building that didn't collapse and continue to have church. So when all the other churches were shut down, all these pastors came to worship with us together and wanted, come on, wanted to just show their gratitude. That's on you. Come on, guys. That's on you. That's what we do when we give into missions. And so I just want to thank you for being so faithful to give to missions. And so we're going to do that right now. Will you guys all join me right now as we pray for our, our, global, our global missions and our, our efforts there? Father, I just thank you so much for such a generous church. Lord, thank you for a people that pour in to the nations. And, Lord, we, we want to see our churches multiply and grow. Lord, we're believing that even within the next two years, they're going to go from 427 global churches or international churches to over a thousand. And we believe that, God. We believe that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even imagine. So, Lord, I pray anoint those pastors. Bless them. We pray for multiplication and growth and health to be upon those churches in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Let's give. Here I am worshiping you with all I am worshiping you I'm bowing down in spirit and truth with lifted hands worshiping you so here I am worshiping Before we close this morning, can I ask you to just do two things for me? Number one, all those who are here that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you made a commitment to serve the Lord, and you said that prayer with me, maybe for the first time, or maybe some of you here just felt the need to recommit your life to the Lord. Can I ask you to do something? Just humor me. Would you stop at our Next Steps booth? We believe that every person here in this church has a next step. And our passion is your purpose. And we want to do everything we can to help equip you, give you the tools you need to grow in the Lord. And so we have people, our connectors are going to be waiting back there. It's right in the center of our lobby. 
go back there and say, hey, I said that prayer, and they're just going to connect with you real briefly. It's not going to take long. But secondly, are you ready? Historically, Father's Day is one of the smallest services or least attended services of the year. Now, I believe it should be the opposite. But for some reason, most dads feel the need. They feel compelled to lay on their lazy boy and watch some kind of foolish sport on Father's Day. I believe that we can break the trend. Dr. Morocco is going to be back next Sunday. He's going to be preaching next Sunday. And I believe that next Sunday, we're going to have one of the largest Father's Day Sundays that we've ever had in the history of this church. Now, of course, we're going to be doing giveaways. We're going to have a taco bar, the whole thing. But how many of you say, Pastor, I can commit to inviting somebody to church next week? Come on. Come on. Maybe some of you, you know what? This may be an opportunity to invite your father to church. And God can save him and heal him. It's going to be a powerful word next week. So, everybody lift your hands to the Lord. Let me pray and declare a blessing over you. Father, I thank you for this mighty congregation. That they are a people of faith. They are a people of power. Lord, that you have called them, that you have chosen them for such a time as this. Lord, I ask that you be with them. Lord, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Lord, I ask, send your angels charge over them. Give them wisdom. Give them a grace this week, Lord. I pray that you lead and guide them. Let them live by faith and not merely by sight. Let them walk by the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And I declare upon their life, Lord God, divine appointments and crazy crazy favor. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you.